whenever you're good. Yeah. Okay. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Marianne Gerges. Uh, it's a pleasure uh, to be with you all. Thank you so much for having me, and thank you to Akram for the invitation. Um, so I'm, I'll start with a, a very basic um, and obvious question, <coughs> given the title of my talk. And the question would be, who here has read this book? book? On the Incarnation by St. Athanasius. That's it? Really? Okay. I'm glad it came. <laughs> so... Um, this book is um, nothing short of a masterpiece, okay? It's, it's definitely a must-read. It's not optional. It's a must-read for every Orthodox Christian. It's actually um, just under 100 pages. It's beautifully and simply written. Um, and I, I highly, highly recommend that as we enter into the month of Kiach and prepare for the Feast of the Nativity, that you all um, take the time to read this seminal work by St. Athanasius. Okay. So, um, the title of my talk is Reaping the First Fruits of the Early Church Fathers, a study of St. Athanasius's On the Incarnation. Um, what do you suppose I mean by first fruits? Just one second. What do you, what do you suppose I mean by first fruits? Um, so anyone, it's actually a biblical term, okay, uh, and let me just pull something up right now. So it actually means, um, in agricultural terms, it actually means uh, the first agricultural produce of a season, especially when given as an offering to God, okay? And the word or the term first fruits has its, um, has its roots in scripture as well. So in Proverbs 3, verse 9, says, uh, Proverbs 3, verse 9 says, Honor the Lord with, the, with thy substance and with the first fruits of all thine increase. And then in Romans 11, verse 16 says, For if the first fruits be holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root be holy, so are the branches. So essentially, reaping the, the first fruits of the early church fathers, it means that they have produced for us incredible writings that they have, you know, passed down from generation to generation. They're ours for the taking, um, and they are the purest and, and best form of teaching that we can possibly hope for. I don't know if you guys are familiar with this expression, but orthodoxy is what Christ taught, the apostles preached, and the fathers kept, okay? So, there is a threefold purpose to this talk, and try to just, so I think it's in play mode, but hopefully it's working. Yeah. There we go. Okay. So the first is to encourage and inspire you all to tap into the rich heritage that is the teachings of the early church fathers. Okay. So to read the old books as it were. All right. The second is to grow deeper in your understanding of salvation. So the why of the incarnation um, which is ultimately love, okay, as you will soon discover. So everything God has done from us, from creating us um, to redeeming us and restoring us, has been born out of love, okay? And thirdly, to spark um, an interest in apologetics. Does anyone um, have any idea what apologetics is? Any idea? Defending no. the faith. Defending the faith. Thank you very much. Very good. And that, too, is rooted in scripture. So it's a branch of theology um, that essentially trains us or enables us to give a reasoned defense for the faith that we have, okay? So it is rooted in scripture as well. In 1 Peter uh, chapter 3, verse 15, um, you have uh, Peter writes, But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do so with gentleness and respect. So actually, in ancient Athens, um, apo apologia or apologia referred to a defense that was made in the courtroom as part of a normal judicial procedure. So after the accusation, the defendant had an opportunity to refute the charges with a, with a defense or reply, an apologia. 
um, and the accused would attempt to speak away apo, um, uh, speak away the accusation. So it is to give a reasoned defense for the faith or for our Orthodox Christian faith. And we as Orthodox Christians need to know what we believe and why we believe it. Now, a second part of uh, Christian apologetics or that verse that often or sometimes gets ignored um, is the second part that says, but do this with gentleness and respect. So defending the Christian faith using apologetics, um, it should never be, it should never involve being rude or angry or disrespectful, even though you strongly disagree with another person's opinion. Um, we should always actually just strive to be strong in our defense and at the same time Christ-like in our presentation. Okay, so if we win a debate and we turn the per person away from Christ or from God, that completely defeats the purpose, right? So Christian apologetics, just remember this as a takeaway, it's not about winning an argument. Yeah, I, I'm so happy that I found that picture. Um, it's about winning hearts to Christ, okay? All right, so now I'm gonna turn back to the first objective, okay? And that is to encourage and inspire you all to tap into the rich heritage that is the teachings of the early church fathers, okay? To read the old books. Anyone here familiar with C.S. Lewis? Yes? Good, good show of hands there. Excellent, some of you. Okay. So um, C.S. Lewis, he actually writes the preface um, to this version of On the Incarnation by St. Athanasius, which I believe was... Um, translated by Father John Baer, and it's the one that's more widely used in the uh, Coptic Orthodox Church. So he actually writes this. He says, There is a strange idea abroad that in every subject the ancient books should be read only by the professionals, and that the amateur should content himself with the modern books. Thus I have found as a tutor in English literature that if the average student wants to find out something about Platonism, the very last thing he thinks of doing is to take a translation of Plato off the library shelf and read the symposium. He would rather read some dreary modern book, 10 times as long, all about isms and influences, and only once in 12 pages telling him what Plato actually said. Okay, Why do you suppose we shy away from the older books and gravitate toward um, the contemporary modern authors and their writings? It's, 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 thank you, tough to understand, very good. I mean, to some of you, it may seem to be a simple question, but it does need some unpacking. Why else? Why do we shy away from the older books? Why haven't we all read this, for example? Which by the end of our talk today, my hope and my prayer is that you're all going to read this. And literally, it's, it's under 100 pages, so um, and it's so beautifully and simply written. So I, I really do encourage you all to read this. Another reason why, yes? The misconception is a hard read. Very good. The, the misconception that it's a hard read. And so um, I'm hoping that with this talk, I'm going to be able to debunk some of those misconceptions and some of those um, ideas that you have about the ancient, uh, the writings of the uh, early church fathers. Why else? Lack of relevance, perhaps? Yes? People tend to shy away from theology. Theology, very good. Yes, it's 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 the study of of God, right? Theology is the study of God. Okay, good. Um, excellent answer. Thank you, Mariana. Okay, so lack of relevance, practicality, um, not relatable, not applicable, and you also probably don't want to go through the perceived trouble of searching and reading the ancient works. Well, C.S. Lewis actually provides a plausible answer as well. Okay. He said that the error is rather an amiable one, for it springs from humility. The student is half afraid to meet one of the great philosoph philosophers face to face. He feels himself inadequate and thinks he will not understand him. But if he only knew the great man just because of his greatness is more intelligible than his modern commentator, the simplest student would be able to understand, if not all, yet a very, very great deal of what Plato said, but hardly anyone can understand some modern books on Platonism. It has always therefore been my one main endeavor as a teacher to persuade the young that first-hand knowledge is not only more worth acquiring than second-hand knowledge, but is usually much easier and more delightful to acquire. Okay? So rather than read the old books, sorry, rather than <coughs> read books about 
okay, great thinkers of the past, he's saying that readers should go directly to the source and obtain first-hand knowledge, which is usually much easier and more delightful to learn. <coughs> this is very good advice, especially as we apply it to St. Athanasius's On the Incarnation, okay? And again, it's a relatively short work. It's just under 100 pages, um, but it develops into a comprehensive, easy-to-read Christology, okay? How's my pitch so far? All right, <laughs> so what is Christology? Does anyone know? Yes? Study of Christ's nature. Excellent, the study of Christ. I, that, that even is more a precise answer. The study of Christ's nature, very good. So a comprehensive, easy-to-read Christology and with beautiful clarity um, expounds upon the why of the incarnation, which is ultimately love, okay? Everything, I'm gonna keep repeating this, everything that God has done from creating us to redeeming us and to restoring us has been born out of his love for us, okay? Now, I, I'm sorry, I'm just harping a little on the C.S. Lewis. Just, I love this introduction, it was just amazing. Um, he goes on to say, naturally, since I myself am a writer, okay, now he was a 20th century um, British, uh, and a prolific writer at that, British author and apologist um, in the 20th century, and he led a lot of people to Christ during the Second World War in the UK, in Britain. He says, naturally, since I myself am a writer, I do not wish uh, the ordinary writer to read no modern books, but if he must read only the new, or only the old, then I would advise him to read the old. Okay, that's how much he loved this book, right? So you're talking about one of the most prolific, as I mentioned, and influential Christian authors on apologetics of the 20th century, telling us, okay, and future generations to prefer and prioritize and ascribe greater value to On the Incarnation and the works of the early church fathers than mere Christianity or The Problem of Pain, which is two of his, um, two of his works, C.S. Lewis. I got through parts of it. Please don't assume I've read all this. I haven't. <laughs> so he then, um, C.S. Lewis, Lewis then states, and I would give him this advice precisely because he is an amateur, listen carefully, <coughs> and therefore much less protected than the expert against the dangers of an exclusive contemporary diet. Okay, what does this mean? What does he mean by an exclusively contemporary diet? Anyone want to hazard a guess? I have a question. I'm just going to ask a, another question here. Um, what do you guys, if you don't mind my asking, um, are there any contemporary Christian authors that you're reading now or that you gravitate towards or that you like? Don't be shy. If you yell at Joyce Meyer, no one's going to punish you, okay? Like, just, just, you know, just uh, please feel free to share. Yes? Um, Anthony Bloom. Anthony Bloom, okay. I haven't heard of him, actually. He, he, uh, he wrote uh, Beginning to Grace. Okay, awesome. Anthony Bloom, I might check him out. Okay, who else? Anyone heard of Dr. Ravi Zacharias? Yeah, okay. I, I, I think he's great. He's wonderful. He's, uh, he's a Christian apologi uh, apologist as well. Okay, anyone else? Okay, there's Rick Warren, there's Max Lucado, there's, I mean, a lot of Protestant to evangelical uh, preachers as well um, that, I, I mean, I listen to from time to time. But it was after a conversation that I had with Abuna Paul, which is always very humbling, by the way. Um, there's this bit of a quiet disapproval during that conversation that I actually uh, was prompted to turn back, um, you know, to the writings of the early church fathers, beginning with On the Incarnation. Okay. So what this means is that, and listen carefully here, please. If we confine or limit ourselves to the modern works or the writings of the contemporary authors or to the interpretation or analyses of, the, of, of scripture, for example, we not only deprive ourselves of receiving the untouched wisdom and insight of the early church fathers, but we also run the risk of deviating from the straight and narrow which we as Orthodox Christians are called uh, to walk. And what's worse, right, for any of you who are servants or Sunday school uh, servants who are teachers of the word, okay, we may also unwittingly or unintentionally be misguiding our youth, right, to whom God has entrusted to us. So it's just something to, to bear in mind. Okay. All right, objective number two. Trust me, I'm going to get into the substance of this text 
very shortly, just bear with me. I know the preamble is a little bit long. Um, so objective number two, okay, is to grow deeper in our understanding of salvation. So the why of the incarnation, which is ultimately love. Again, everything God has done for us, from creating us to redeeming us, is born out of love. When we contemplate our salvation, okay, we shouldn't think of it simply in terms of Christ's crucifixion, death, resurrection, and ascension. It actually, the, the concept or the plan of salvation spans the entire life of Christ. And it begins with the conception, okay? It begins with the conception. So the first feast that we celebrate in the Coptic Orthodox Church in the life of Christ is in fact the Annunciation to the Virgin Mary, right? So the feast is celebrated as the conception of Christ, the Immaculate Conception of Christ, in which the Virgin Mary conceives, already begins conceiving of Christ through her ears, through her listening, um, and through to, uh, to the words of, of uh, Angel Gabriel as he's announcing the birth of Christ to her. So she's already conceiving him through her ears and her listening. Um, okay, so now, before again, just before we get into the text, I just want to talk to you a little bit about the life uh, of Saint Athanasius. He was he went by several names, um, including Saint Athanasius of Alexandria, Saint Athanasius the Apostolic, um, and one he was one of the few early church fathers that was given the name Great Saint Athanasius the Great. Okay, he was born in 293, um, again in Alexandria, and he died May 2nd, 373. AD, and his feast day is usually celebrated May the 2nd. He was a theologian, an ecclesiastical statesman, an Egyptian national leader, and a patriarch and pope of Alexandria. So he also received his philosophical and theological training in Alexandria, and in 325 AD, does anyone know what council took place that year? Very important. Is it there already? It's there, the answer's there. It's been a long day. Council of Nicaea, right? Now, he, the, he attended there as a deacon, okay, with the, with, um, uh, the Bishop of Alexandria, Bishop Alexander, um, and he was the chief defender of Christian orthodoxy in the fourth century battle against Arianism, okay? This we all, I think, are familiar with the Arian heresy, um, and this was that the Son of God was, in fact, a creature, okay, created of like but not the same essence or substance as God the Father. Um, so this was important. This was a very important heresy which, um, you know, St. Athanasius fought so hard um, to, to, to defend against. And interestingly enough, this book, to the best of my knowledge, is written before the Arian heresy. This was written around 318. Like in, in apparently it was written in his late teens, um, or in his 20s. So it seems to anticipate uh, the Arian heresy um, in many ways. Okay, so he was a recognized theologian, an aesthetic. Um, he was an obvious candidate, of course, to succeed Bishop Alexander when he passed away in 328. And the first years of his epic uh, episcopacy was devoted to um, visiting his extensive patriarch, uh, patriarchate, in, um, which included Egypt and Libya. And during this time, he... Um, he established important contacts, of course, with Coptic monks in Upper Egypt um, and their leader, St. Uh, Bohemios, and I believe St. Anthony as well, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. He was exiled. Can anyone guess how many times? Anyone know? Five times. Five times during um, his 17-year episcopacy. Okay, we're going to get into that a little bit later. All right, the structure and style. Of, on the incarnation. So as I mentioned, it's just 57 uh, chapters. That sounds like a lot, but each um, each chapter is just a few pages long. It's just under 100 pages. St. Athanasius' style is very simple and straight to the point. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's rife, and I mean full, of analogies so that we can understand, um, you know, what is potentially a very complex uh, topic, which is the identity and the nature of Christ. There are 14 analogies, to be exact, that deliver these explanations home to the reader. Um, on the Incarnation, it describes really the economy of salvation, okay? Economy meaning the plan or the order of salvation. And as C.S. Lewis, I'm going to keep coming back to him, sorry. C.S. Lewis writes, only a mastermind, by the way, this is like in the 1940s, okay? He's writing about St. Athanasius, this was written... 1,600 years previously, or 1,500 years previously. 
Um, and as he writes, only a mastermind could in the fourth century have written so deeply on such a subject with such classical simplicity. Every page I read confirmed this impression. On the Incarnation can be divided into six parts, according to Father John Baer's translation. Part one, the divine dilemma regarding life and death. That's chapters t two to 10. Part two, the divine dilemma regarding knowledge and ignorance, uh, chapters 11 to 19. Part three, the death of Christ and the resurrection um, of the body, chapters 20 to 32. Part four, the refutation of the Jews, uh, chapters 33 to 40. Part five, refuta refutation of the Gentiles, that's you and me, possibly, uh, ch chapters 41 to 55. And part six, the conclusion, chapters 55 to 57. And much of this, um, these last two parts um, are very apologetic in nature. All right, now we're going to get into it, okay? Sorry about um, that extended preamble. So. Chapters 1 to 6 set the stage for the Incarnation, okay? Very important to understand. The same God who created, who providentially created humanity, is the same God who redeems it, okay? So St. Athanasius points out that um, only one who had, uh, the only one who had created humanity could be the one to fix it and to save humanity. And he writes this, he says, the renewal of creation has been wrought by the self-same word who made it in the beginning. There was no inconsistency between creation and salvation for the one father has employed the same agent for both works, affecting the salvation of the world through the same word who made it in the beginning. Okay, so creation, right, is ordered with God the Father and God the Son as co-creators -co together, okay, together with the Holy Spirit from the beginning. We call Genesis. 1 uh, verse 26 it says let us who's us who's us let us uh, create um, man in our image according to our likeness the yes right so the eternity existed you know from eternity past and, and into eternity present and eternity future like it's it's always been there the trinitarian god has always existed <coughs> even from the uh, before creation before the foundation of the world. So as humans, it's important that we understand that our fundamental and essential property was to be God's best and perfect creation, okay? Now, by virtue of our union with God and having been created in his likeness, we become extensions of God. We don't necessarily become God-like, although I've heard, like, I mean, in terms of some of the sermons I've heard on the Incarnation, um, Father Daniel Habib, for example, will say that we become like gods, but very important to understand, we don't become one of the Trinity. We, um, we're not objects of worship. We don't necessarily adopt the divine attributes of God, such as omniscience or omnipotence, but we do partake of his likeness. We do have a share in that, okay? So he creates Adam and Eve, and he sets us on the path and gives us free will, okay? To accept or reject his commandment. So prior to eating from the tree of, um, of knowledge of good and evil, okay, very important to understand this, humanity was not subject to corruptibility, okay? Not subject to corruptibility. Because why? Because it was by God's grace, okay, or grace, the grace of our union with God that we were not prone to death and corruptibility. And corruptibility. Once Adam and Eve choose to disobey God, and eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, that union effectively becomes broken. It's severed. And so begins the dissolution of humanity. Here we are, okay? So, and the dissolution of humanity is what <coughs> the incarnation comes to address. And now we come to the divine dilemma, okay? So this is what St. Athanasius writes. This is, this is the beautiful part. This is the whole purpose of the incarnation. So as the rational creatures were wasting and such works in the course of ruin, what was God in his goodness to do? Okay, and the answer, of course, is the incarnation. But the how and the why of the incarnation is going to need some unpacking. Okay? Now, St. Athanasius is very... Um, very smart. He, he anticipated that he, he wants us to guard against any easy solutions or answers, okay, to this problem, right? So he provides four plausible solutions, 
which may arise in our own minds, okay? The first, why did God not simply excuse or forgive um, Adam and Eve their sin, okay? Can someone read this for me, please? My voice is getting a little raspy. I'll read it. Later. Thank you. For death, as I had said above, gained from that time forth illegal, hold over us, and it was impossible to evade the law since it had been laid down by God because of the transgression, and the result was in truth one monstrous and unseemingly. For it was monstrous first that God, having spoken, should prove false, that when he had ordained that man, if he had transgressed the commandment, should die the death after this transgression, man should not die, but God's word should be broken. For God would not be true if when he said we would die, man died not. Very good. Any thoughts or comments on that? What I mean, I know the answer is just below. Sorry, I gotta master the master the, the the PowerPoint that just lets me, you know, create the answer. I'm not very good at that. Um, so why didn't God just let us? Uh, sorry, why didn't God just forgive us? Why couldn't He just forgiven us our our sins? Said, okay, so so God had said to them, right? If you eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you shall surely die. Like, how is God going to now go back on his word? He would be falsifying himself. And that would not be consistent with God's nature, right? To falsify himself or to go back on his word. So that's not the solution. All right? So there's your defense of that. Do you see how this is an apologetic as well? Okay. Next possible solution. So why didn't God just let humanity perish? Khalas, you sinned. You've made your choice. Um, why didn't he let? Why didn't God let humanity perish in its sin and corruption and just start again? Okay, who wants to read other than Akram? And if you need to come closer, I understand. I'm sorry, it's a little small, but I'd like another volunteer. Should I ask Peter? Hi, Peter. Sure. Okay, thank you. Just the verse. Yes, just the blue. Yeah. Again, it were unseemly that creatures once in fashion having partaken of the word should be loaded. Thank you very much, Peter. So the answer is actually within the text itself, right? Because for we're not worthy of God's goodness, okay? Would not be consistent with his, um, with his goodness to let man perish. Solution number three. So why did God, why did not God then simply let humanity die out? Let them die out. Who'd like to read this part? <clears throat> I'll read it. It's okay. So, as the rational creatures were wasting, we had actually read this, uh, I had quoted this before. So, as the rational creatures were wasting and such works were in course of ruin, what was God in his goodness to do? Suffer corruption to prevail against them and death to hold them fast? And where were the profit of their having been made to begin with? For better were they not made than once made, left, excuse me, left to neglect and ruin. For neglect reveals weakness and not goodness on God's part. If that is, he allows his own work to be ruined when once he had made it, more so than if he had never made man at all. For if he had not made them, none could impute weakness. But once he had made them and created them out of nothing, it were most monstrous for the work to be ruined, and that before the eyes of, of the maker. It was then out of the question to leave men to the current corruption, to the current of corruption, because this would be unseemly and unworthy of God's goodness. Again, Again, it would be inconsistent not only with God's goodness, but with his, um, his loving and merciful nature as well. It's in his nature to fix. It's in his nature to help. It's in his nature um, to, to solve and to, to extend mercy and love, even though we do not deserve it. So, solution number four. But, uh, why couldn't we have repented? Why couldn't they have just repented? God, I'm sorry. We repent all the time, right? Halas. Forgive me. I'm sorry. I come to you with a contrite and, and broken heart, and, um, and I'm seeking your forgiveness. The reason is this, okay? Repentance does not recall from men. Again, I'm quoting um, St. Athanasius here. Repentance does not call, recall men from what is according to his nature. All that it does is to make them cease from sinning, okay? 
So had it just been a minor dis demeanor or a trespass or whatever, and not subsequent corruption, we have to understand now that our nature has now been corrupted, okay, irreversibly so. Repentance would have well been enough. But when one sin transgression had begun, men came under the corruption proper to their nature. Bereft of grace, okay? Remember, it was by the virtue, by virtue of the, the grace, uh, the union that we had with God, that we were not subject to corruptibility. Once Adam and Eve disobeyed, they disconnected themselves from God, from the source of life, and they were subject to corruptibility, okay? So repentance could not meet the case. Now, the incarnation, all right? So, the incarnation becomes necessary, okay? None of these solutions um, will work. So, St. Athanasius has set up a theological premise, okay? That God the Father and God the Son, or God the Word, create, sustain, and redeem together. Um, in which humanity's sin, okay? Humanity's sin has the twin effects of death and corruption. And the situation of humanity's sin is such that it cannot persevere into an eternal blessed life with God, okay? The eternal blessed life. Now, now sin has even blind, blinded them from perceiving the image of God, from knowing God, okay? So now the incarnation has its work to do, has to recreate humanity in the divine image, okay? The corrupted humanity needs to be restored to the likeness and image of God. So God does what? He takes flesh. He unites himself with a body, okay? And he becomes the God-man. He forms within himself a bridge between God and man in himself, okay? So with the incarnation, as I just mentioned, God takes one of our bodies, he takes it on completely, not just in appearance, he takes on our human nature as well. So he is fully defined and he is fully human, right? Um, and he takes on a body that is corruptible or subject to death. Very important that you understand this point. In order to defeat that death, and because the incarnate word is without sin, okay, Jesus, God himself, God is without sin, or Jesus is without sin, his sin undoes the relationship between sin and death, okay? All the bodies, which is us, we can now hold to this one body, okay, of Christ, and we die with that body as well when he dies, okay? So all the bodies hold to this body, also die with this one body and die in him, having our sinful nature die with, not his sinful nature, but you, you see what I'm saying, with the body, right, that he has taken to himself. So in taking on human nature, at the same time, he consecrates all of humanity, all of human nature, and he sanctifies it, okay? And he lends to us, he lends to humanity its dignity. There's an interesting um, icon, and again, this is just from listening to a sermon by uh, Father Daniel Habib. There's an icon um, in which the iconographer decides to have, he depicts Saint Athanasius um, as stepping on the face or, or uh, as stepping on Arius. Okay, and so um, it's it's interesting. It, you know, according to to Father um, Daniel Habib, he, he was saying that this was maybe a mistake um, that the iconographer made because you can never step on the image of God. You can never. It, it it's it would be disgraceful to do that. Arian did represent a heresy, yes, um, but perhaps it could have been depicted in a different way. But you never step on the image of of, of God. It, it's something that's very sacred. And by virtue of God having taken on human nature and taken on a body, now um, the human body and, and human humanity is, is something that's sacred. Okay? Now, let me see here. Where are we? Okay. So humans are holy and are full, are full of dignity by virtue of Christ being fully divine, having united himself with a human, um, with human form. Okay? Next, the incarnation, the second work of the incarnation, he has to rest, it has to restore humanity to the incorruptible life, okay? Restored to its intended um, incorruptible life, ready for the eternal and blessed life. So St. Athanasius writes, and that secondly, whereas men had turned toward corruption, he might turn them again toward incorruption and quicken them from death by the appropriation 
of his body and by the grace of the resurrection, banishing death from, from them like straw from the fire. So what is the purpose of, of, of restored humanity? It's to know God, right? Corruption and sin had dimmed us, had blinded us from, um, uh, from the image, from understanding, from apprehending um, who God was. So the purpose of recreated and restored humanity is to know God. So St. Athanasius writes, he gives us a share in his own image in our Lord Jesus Christ um, and makes them after his own image and after his likeness so that by such grace, perceiving the image, that is the word of the Father, they may be able through him to get an idea of the Father and knowing their maker, live the happy and truly blessed life. Okay, so has humanity is recreated and restored through the incarnation and specifically through the death and the resurrection of Christ, they are now, now able to perceive the image of God and the word. So humanity's corruption, as I just mentioned, it had blinded us to the truth of God. Our vision of God was effectively dimmed by sin. Um, and as humanity is recreated and restored to the divine image by Jesus Christ, humanity is now able to perceive the image of God and the word of God who reveals to us God in the Father. Recall John uh, chapter 14, verse 16. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And consider how many times the word know is used here, okay? This knowledge of God. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. So Jesus is like, he's like the icon of the Father, right? So he is the express image of God. He is the icon of the Father. And this knowledge is, okay, this knowledge, which is so important, it is, it not just allows, but it is what it, what St. Athanasius refers to as the blessed, eternal, and incorruptible life. All right, conclusion. <laughs> so we often think um, about our Lord Jesus Christ becoming incarnate just to save us, right, from our sins, and that's it, okay? And that's a shame, right? We, we, need to, we need to contemplate the incarnation, especially as we approach um, the Christmas season. And that's why I'm imploring you all to please, please, just take, take the time to read this beautiful work. Again, just under 100 pages. There are going to be a lot of things in the next uh, couple of months that are going to be competing for your time and your attention. Um, and I could go through the list. But I would encourage and implore you all to just ground yourself Right? Like when we think of Easter and you think of like the reason for the season, I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> like it's just, you know, it's so superficial. Yes, we know it's Jesus, but we need to take a few more steps beyond that. And so one way we can do that is actually um, read on the incarnation uh, by St. Athanasius, okay? And anchor ourselves um, in the teachings of the early church fathers, which are just so, so unbelievably precious. We owe a great debt of gratitude uh, to St. Athanasius and to all of the early church fathers who've kept us, um, you know, on, on the straight and narrow and on the right way. Does anyone know, like, orthodox, what does that mean? What does ortho mean, right? To make straight, right? Your orthodontics, you get your, yeah, get it. Okay, <laughs> good. All right, so, um, okay, so we often think of our Lord Jesus Christ uh, becoming incarnate in order to save us from our sins. For many, that is where we, the, the thinking stops, the contemplation stops, okay? And this is very simplistic thinking. Let's avoid this. The, the, Jesus is the reason for the season. That's simplistic, okay? And this type of thinking doesn't allow us to fully understand what humanity actually means to Jesus Christ, right? This, this book is all about his love for us. It always comes down to that. So it helps us uncover what you and I mean to God, okay? And it leads, us, it leads us to so many revelations about God the Father and his character. So um, we don't believe that we are just, you know, crowns of God's creation because of our own speculations or conclusions. We believe it because of the incarnation, okay? The fact, the simple fact that God became incarnate and, God, and condescended to us, to humanity, um, to save us. So... Um, St. Athanasius, he arms us with a thorough and complete understanding of who Christ is so that, and again, this is something that I touched upon at the beginning, so that we'll be able to reject the subtle and nuanced attempts to dilute both the theological heritage of the church and the living word revealed to us in scripture. He serves also as a role model to us today, okay, and in his 
and I love this, of course, I think all of you, if not most of you, are familiar with this. So in his, in his introduction, uh, sorry, C.S. Lewis, that's the typo, reminds us that, um, of his epitaph, of St. Athanasius' epitaph, which is Athanasius against the world, Athanasius contra mundum, right? That's the Latin. Um, so when informed, I said to him, St. Athanasius, you know, when informed that the whole world was against him because of his defense, of his view of Christ's divinity, St. Athanasius, what did he say? He said, then I am against the world. Okay, so like St. Athanasius, we have to be ready to stand against that which, you know, the popular heterodoxy. What's heterodoxy? Anyone? What is heterodoxy? Anyone give an educated guess? It just hetero means other or different, so other than the accepted um, or orthodox teachings of the church or the culture. And um, there was one last point I think I wanted to make. Yes, so, and oftentimes, of course, there is, um, there is a cost, right, uh, you know, to standing up for the truth. We know that, right? Over the course of his life, I mentioned he was exiled five times um, over his 17-year episcopacy. He often retreated to the desert, um, and during this period, he actually spent over 17 years in five different exiles ordered by four different emperors. Um, he, he sat sub and subjected himself, he sat with, um, he subjected himself to monasticism and to the ascetics and to the, I guess, the tutelage and the guidance of St. Anthony and St. Pachamios. And among the pieces of wisdom he was able to glean um, while he was with the, the Desert Fathers was, was this. Anyone who wishes to understand the mind of the sacred writers must first cleanse his own life and approach the saints by copying their deeds. And may we all um, sort of, you know, you know, take a page, literally and figuratively, from um, St. Athanasius and emulate his life and his works and his perseverance um, in maintaining the truths. Uh, glory be to God forever and ever. Amen. All right, so. Um, any, any questions? So who's going to get this? <laughs> right? It's very easy. You can get it on Kindle. It's like 20 bucks on Amazon. I personally prefer, you know, cracking open the spine and, and reading an actual book. This was lent to me. This is on loan. Um, you can get it on Kindle. You can order it on Amazon. You can even get the audio book. Dude, like I understand some people, you know, they learn better uh, processing it, you know, audibly, and that's, that's fine too. But whatever you do in the next six weeks, as I say, as you, as we enter into the month of Kiyak and prepare for the Feast of the Nativity, I implore you all to read this beautiful masterpiece. Okay, it is a, it's a treasure treatise among um, uh, Orthodox and Orthodox Christians. So please, please read it. Okay, ground yourself in this. Very good. All right, well, that's it. That's all for me. Any any thoughts? Any questions about what we uh, discussed today? You were all great audience. Thank you. Very quiet, but good. <laughs> That's okay. It's late. That's good. Any questions? Uh, and I do apologize for those who may have heard some of this already. We had a servants retreat uh, last weekend. So I have Peter. I don't know if Peter was there, but Sarah was definitely there. I don't know if Hero was there, but I recognize some junior high servants here. Hey. So uh, yeah. Okay. That's good. No questions, guys, at all? Thoughts? Comments? Okay, just read the book. <laughs> Did someone have a question? No? Okay. Oh, I had a splitting headache when I came in. And Maybe you should ask questions, Maria, so people make sure that, that they understood. <laughs> a lot of questions actually throughout the, the talk. I, I was worried it was going to go too long. Well, it's 40 minutes. That's kind of long. Um, I, I really don't have anything to ask. <laughs> well, what are the four arguments? <laughs> oh, oh, I see. Okay, okay. Does anyone remember what the four plausible solutions were um, to, the, to the divine dilemma? Why not just forgive them? Good. What was the second? Good. I can send this PowerPoint to Aki as well. Um, if you guys wanted to, you know, look it over, review it, that, that's by all means. I honestly, I have just scratched the surface um, with, with this book. Uh, there's uh, mainly the, what we just covered was chapters 2 to 11. That's it. 
um, but there's just so much more. Um, so I can even come back and give a second part at some point if you want. Okay? Yeah, absolutely.